Commander Neville, head of Scotland Yard's anti-terrorist branch, said it was clear that death was not due to natural causes. He said the Yard and other branches were treating the case as one of death under suspicious circumstances. But in Markov's home country, Bulgaria, the news of his death was censored. His cousin Lubin, who still lives next to the little house where they grew up, can remember how the family eventually heard the news. Nothing was mentioned officially or in the media. I heard about it from friends. I always knew that the state wouldn't let Georgi get away with his life. Markov's family had good reason to suspect that the Bulgarian government might be involved. Since his defection in 1969, Markov had been declared an enemy of the state. After 1969, his name ceased to exist. He wasn't even mentioned. They removed his books from the libraries. They even scratched his name out of the credits of his films. Markov retaliated with his own form of revenge. He started writing scripts criticizing President Zhivkov on Radio Free Europe, an American station broadcasting into the Eastern Bloc. He mocked Zhivkov, calling him a minor dictator with a second-rate sense of humor. Despite attempts to jam the signal, half the population of Bulgaria still managed to listen to these programs. He captured the primitivism and snobism of Zhivkov. He showed the ambitions of a mediocre man an ill-educated, unintelligent man. When Dimitar Bochev first heard of Markov's death, he immediately suspected foul play. This happened exactly on the birthday of Todor Zhivkov. I don't believe this was a coincidence. Zhivkov had given himself a birthday present. Back in London, the police questioned Markov's doctors to try to establish the cause of death. His symptoms were too complex to be caused by a simple infection. They were beginning to suspect he really had been poisoned. His blood pressure started to fall, his temperature dropped, and his white count rose. And all of those things indicate severe septic shock. He had been given the appropriate therapy to cover a wide spectrum of bacteria that could cause this and had not responded. And I was beginning to think about what else it could be. I really started to think that he might have, uh, it was some, could have been a snake venom, sort of a pit viper venom or something like that. To begin the murder inquiry, the police needed evidence that he had been poisoned. 24 hours after Markov's death, an autopsy was carried out to look for further clues. The poison had left no trace in Markov's bloodstream, but it had affected all of his major organs, as pathologist Rufus Crompton discovered. There were definitely relevant changes in a large number of organs, mainly hemorrhages and lymph glands in the groin on the right-hand side, which is the side the puncture mark was on, was swollen. This suggested to me that something had gone into the back of his leg, uh, which had traveled in the lymph up to the lymph glands and had there caused a reaction. The swollen lymph glands indicated that Markov's body had been fighting an extremely powerful poison. Crompton's next problem was how to preserve the evidence around the wound on Markov's thigh. I was wondering whether to cut into the puncture mark and down through it, and then I thought, well, no, there may be something in there apart from poisons. There may be, for instance, the tip of a needle or something, and I may well do more harm than good by poking around it. Scotland Yard decided that the tissue around the wound should be handled by specialists. 
The laboratory they chose was synonymous with the mysterious world of poisons and Cold War spy cases. Porton down. I think the fact that this was espionage or an assassination, and there was an international flavor to it, you know, sort of almost a, there's something rather James Bondish about this. And Porton Down would be the right people to deal with that. Porton Down was one of the most secret research centers in Britain, specializing in biochemical weapons. The laboratory now took over the poison's investigation, bringing in experts from all over the world. One was a chemical weapons specialist from the CIA, Christopher Green. My specialty as an intelligence officer was to study foreign advances in chemical and biological terrorism and chemical warfare. Green was at Porton Down when the team examining Markov's flesh wound made an astonishing breakthrough. Sections of the tissue were being sliced and the prosector's knife blade struck something that he felt was metal, initially thinking that it was a needle, but a small plink sound occurred, and it was very easy to see that it was a very tiny, round ball bearing that looked like it came from the tip of a ballpoint pen. Intrigued by this latest find, Scotland Yard brought the pellet back to London for the ballistics lab to investigate. I'd never seen anything like it before. I don't think anybody else had. I was asked to examine it, to find out what it was made of, um, to investigate its nature, to produce some good quality uh, photographs in the electron microscope. When Porton Down examined and cleaned the pellet, they could find no traces of poison. Now as Keeley placed it under the microscope, he found the tiny object extremely hard to handle. One had to be very careful that it didn't whiz out and disappear. I mean, it did several times for me. And I you know, had to get down on my hands and knees um, with a big beaker of water and sweep up all the dust off the floor and put it in the water. And finally, and much to my relief, um, the pellet dropped out with a satisfying ping and hit the bottom of the beaker. The electron microscope showed that the pellet was made of platinum iridium, an inert alloy, probably chosen so that the body wouldn't reject it. The intriguing revelation was that it contained two tiny holes. The pellet itself was harmless. It clearly wasn't the pellet that killed him, it was what was in those holes. The two holes formed a well for the poison that would pass into Markov's bloodstream. The pellet was probably sealed with a gelatinous coating to retain the poison. When it was fired, it passed through the clothes and into the flesh. It's thought the body heat melted the coating, releasing the poison into the bloodstream. There may have been some sugary material, a waxy material or whatever, which would uh, dissolve. Uh, or break up, and allowing the material to release. The well holes in Markov's pellet were empty, so it was not possible to identify the poison. Just as the investigation seemed to be stalling, there was an unexpected breakthrough. News filtered through of a similar attack in Paris. Two weeks before Markov's attack, another Bulgarian had felt something sting him in the back. This time, however, the victim had survived to tell the tale. Right. It's about here. At that moment, after we'd come out into the light, just before we got off the escalator, I felt something hit me in my back. I turned around, thinking it must have been thrown from the balcony behind me. Uh, 